Thank you for that wonderful song. My Redeemer lives. Can we say amen to that? I want to believe that you came here for a reason. I want to believe that you came here because you are hearing the kingdom of God calling you, beckoning you to come and be ready. Yes, we are in that sphere of time which we say is the kingdom of grace, but very, very soon the kingdom of glory is going to dawn upon each one of us. And when it dawns, when it comes, I want to imagine all of us here waiting, joyfully waiting for the revelation of Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven. I long for that day to come. And I'm praying that all of us, when that day comes, we'll all be found ready and eager to enter into the glories of that heaven. I love music. For some reasons, wherever I go, I try to come up with a way by which I can sing. And I hope you don't mind if tonight I bring with me here a group of uh, singers. We call ourselves the hymn singers. When I do my evangelistic meetings, I bring them along with me. When I make my uh, sermons in the churches I visit, I bring them with me. And tonight, I want you to listen to the hymn singers because the song that I'll be singing tonight is a song that leads us into an understanding that yes, the kingdom of glory is almost upon us. We can see that light streaming from that kingdom of glory. We can see the glimpse of that golden morning. The golden morning is fast approaching, Jesus soon will come to take his faithful and happy children to their promised home. Oh, we see the glimpse of the golden morning piercing through this night of gloom. Oh, we see the glimpse of the golden morning that will burst the The gospel summons will soon be carried to the nations round. The bridegroom then will cease to tarry and the trumpet sound. Oh, we see the gleams of the golden morning piercing through night of gloom. Oh, we see the seeds of the golden morning that will bless the tomb. Attended by all the shining angels down the flaming sky. The Golden morning, piercing 
The golden morning is fast approaching. Jesus soon will come. Are you ready for that great day? I am very glad because when Jesus came here on earth to give us an idea of the things that are waiting for us, he spoke many times in language that people can understand. And tonight, I want to draw your attention to a particular form of speech that Jesus used to bring to the people and make people understand the things that relate to the kingdom of God. Tonight's subject is 5 plus 5 plus 5. That's actually, oh, 5 plus 5 equals 5. <laughs> That's the title. Last night I was supposed to speak to you about the pearl of great price. I wasn't able to do that, and I thought that tonight maybe I can combine the two together. So let's try to see what we can do. Jesus spoke in parables, and I love parables. And I'm sure that tonight, as we draw our attention to the two parables of Jesus, I'm sure we will learn things that will help us understand better the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful night that we can once more come together, study your words, fellowship with one another, and listen to your spirit. Oh God, speak to us tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Parables. How wonderful of Jesus to use this very familiar mode of conveying messages to the people around him. Parables, they are not your normal stories, but Jesus used them particularly to conceal or reveal truths meant to get to the hearts and minds of his audience. He used them generously to touch the very center of decision-making of various people that he mingled with. He would sometimes use trite, stale language, or he would employ hackneyed expressions, but give them nouvelle significance. One way or the other, Jesus' parabolic language was meant to elicit a response designed, designed either to lead someone to come to Jesus or draw away from him. Unless otherwise expressed by Jesus himself, parables are normally there or given out to draw our attention to one basic point. Academicians call that one basic point the tertium comparationis, the point of comparison. For truly, parables are analogies by which Jesus would extract decisive things pertaining to the kingdom of God. They are meant to stir up people's view of God and evoke from them a resolve to follow God or not, to accept or reject God's offer of salvation and grace. You can tell that I love parables. I like parables. We'll consider two of them tonight. From Matthew 13, 45 to 46, we find this parable of the pearl of great price. Again, said Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Simple sentence, full of meaning, full of significance. Pearls, how fascinating they are how enticing their luster, how intriguing their conception. And this man had this one particular desire or dream, if you want to call it. All throughout his life, he had been a merchant of pearls. He had seen them all, white pearls, black pearls, maybe yellow pearls, maybe other varieties. But there was one pearl which had eluded him somehow, that most 
precious of all pearls, the pearl of great price. He had no idea what that pearl would look like. He had no idea what color it would have. He had no idea about its shape, its price, its value. Deep in his heart, however, he knew that if he saw it, he could say for sure that that was the pearl he was looking for. The pearl of great price. But Jesus also told this parable. This is a story about the ten virgins taken from Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, which focuses on getting ready for the arrival of the bridegroom. It's quite a long parable, but I'm not going into the details. Let me just go straight to the point. In real life, this was, of course, referring to the return of Jesus. Here, in this parable of the ten virgins, we have two main groups of people getting themselves ready to meet the bridegroom. Somewhere in that parable, it tells you that the bridegroom is going to come at midnight. The, the timing of the bridegroom's arrival is perfect. There was no question as to the when or to the what. The what is the arrival of the bridegroom. The time is or the when is midnight. Whether it is literal midnight or the midnight of the sinfulness of this world, it's up to you to work on it. But the one who is coming is most significant for us. And the time of his arrival is indeed something that we should all long for. Who was coming? The bridegroom. When was he to arrive? At midnight. The scene was perfectly set. Towards the end, we stare at two groups of people making ready for the coming of the bridegroom. However, as we come closer to the end of the parable, we find that only half, only half really made themselves truly ready. How many were they? Ten. How many truly made ready for the coming of the bridegroom? Only five. Have you ever wondered how we got the title, five plus five is equal to five? Don't get me wrong. My math is okay. I know that two plus two is equal to four. But don't get me to the higher arithmetic or math. I might have a problem answering you. All I remember was that when my teacher uh, was teaching us arithmetic and he was discussing things on a higher level, I absented myself. So I didn't get much of it. But I think my math is okay. Five plus five equals five. Ten people getting ready for the coming of Jesus. Only five came out truly ready. When rubber meets the road, it all comes down to who really got themselves ready. What a beautiful parable. The parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the pearl of great price. For a few minutes, let's leave this pearl merchant and his amazing quest for the pearl of great price, as well as the ten virgins and the coming bridegroom. And let us look into the times, the milieu of the parables. Of course, it was Jesus who was speaking. It was the most difficult of times. It was the most bothersome period. It was a most trying life, especially for the Jews. Jobs were scarce. Money was hard to come by. There was practically no economy in place. Worse, this proud people, the Jews, who once heard the voice of God speaking to them in Mount Sinai, was now known to be hearing the booming voice of their captors shouting their decrees from the seven hills of Rome. 
these truly proud people who was once promised by God that they would be a special people above all others had now become a real special people, special because they have become the focus of laughter and ridicule by their Roman masters. These special people who were once chosen to reveal to the world who the true God of the universe is, these people now were chosen to be the subject of derision and scorn for their sometimes inordinate observance of the seventh day. To the Jews, a mark of allegiance to their God, but to others, a sign of a bizarre devotion to an unknown deity. These people, whose God once gave them a king and a kingdom, supposedly to stand strong forever, thought never to be overthrown, never to be overcome, never to be subjugated, now were a people, literally, and sometimes, most times, figuratively bound in chains, overcome, and their lofty dreams of nationhood thrown into utter disarray. Their visions of sovereignty and dominion now trampled underfoot. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. From a special pedestal because of their unbelief, because of their unwillingness to listen to the voice of God, they have fallen. How the mighty have fallen. That last line, is that not familiar to us all? You remember David? When Saul and Jonathan died together in battle, David in great lamentation came up with one of the most memorable dirges to honor the fallen of Israel. He called them the mighty, the fallen mighty. So we read in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 19 to 27, the mournful song of David. Listen to the depths of pathos and the mel melancholy cry of sheer despondency. David was saying, The beauty of Israel is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. O mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew, nor rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For the shield of the mighty is cast away there, the shield of soul not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, and the sword of soul did not return empty. Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives, and in their death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, David went on. They were stronger than lions, O daughters of Israel. Whip over soul who clothe you in scarlet with luxury, who put ornaments of gold in your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. Yes, the Jews love to recite their heritage. They loved to speak of the exploits of Saul and especially of valiant David, their king. They longed to recall the days when they, he sent the army of the Philistines fleeing in utter fear and dismay, having seen Goliath, their champion, fall dead at the hands of a young David. Ah, this David, whose heart was after God's own heart. This was the David to whom was promised the kingdom of God. This was the David to whom God gave the assurance that his throne will last forever. It was only David. If it was not David, if it was not only David, he would not have problems. Oh yeah, it's true. David, he was also a sinner like you and me. He also fell into the death traps of sinful flesh. 
he also tinkered with sin and felt it sting mightily. There was this one big difference though. He was sinful, like you and me. He turned his back on God one time. But the big difference in his life and in my life and in the lives of many of us is this. He sincerely repented. And oh, how he repented. With a truly repentant heart, he saw the sinfulness of sin. He felt his grip on God slipping away from him. And from somewhere, he recalled the dictum that God's spirit will not always strive with man. This terrible gloom so it smothered him that before he sank any deeper in the mire of sin, he made a decision to return to God before he completely lost sight of his maker in a desperate plea to the gracious God. He fell on his knees and cried out, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you, O God, against you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. David thought, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me behold he asked God and he told God you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom purge me O God purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me, O God, a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take away your Holy Spirit from me. And then, yes, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. This prayer of David could actually be my prayer. This could actually be our prayer. It's unfortunate that the Jews did not realize that the spiritual battles in the heart and in the mind are what matter most. The Jews instead continued to focus on the physical battles they had to wage against their political national Roman captors. And the more they focused on such battles, the more they longed for the appearance of the Messiah they molded according to their own desires. God gave them a clear picture of who the Messiah was, of what the characteristics of the Messiah when he comes. But because they were so intent on seeing their own Messiah when he came, when he arrived, They did not recognize him. In their understanding, when the Messiah arrives, they had this firm belief that the course of their history and that of the world will change so dramatically. Liberty from their captors, freedom from slavery, restoration of the kingdom of David, reestablishment of the fortunes of Israel. What a glorious sight! So they longed for the kingdom more than anything else. For many Jews, it became their bread and butter, so to speak. It filled the whole mind and it captivated their imagination and fueled their nationalistic hopes and desires. Ah, the kingdom of God. 
are the kingdom of heaven, are the kingdom of David, synonymous terms, they were one and the same. They could only think. of the kingdom of God in their own terms. Yes, how saddening that when the Messiah came, they did not recognize him. Oh yes, they joined him at the beginning in the hope that he would fulfill their material, nationalistic aspirations. Initially, they saw some of his mighty deeds, heard some of his profound teachings, felt even the power of his presence. It is unfortunate, however, that they, they did not understand. They did not comprehend. They did not realize he was the one sent by God to restore the fortunes of Israel. How ironic can a situation be? He whom they have waited for, he whom they longed for, he whom they eagerly anticipated, when he finally came, he was not recognized. Sad, very sad. In an effort to make them understand, Jesus had to convey his message using language and forms of his speech very familiar to his hearers. So he used parables. So he related to them the parable of the great pearl of great price. He also told them about the parable of the ten virgins. Mind you, these two parables were told separately on two different occasions. But they are so connected, I found out that they could be mentioned in one go, which is why tonight I brought their, them into one in the hope that we would see and we would hear the kingdom of God calling us, beckoning us. The merchant knew what he was doing. He had been a pearl merchant probably for the major portion of his life. And now he is set into finding the real pearl that would make the difference. He was looking, searching for the pearl of great price. I can tell you many things about that parable, but there's one thing I'd like to point out. It is the seeking, the searching of this merchant for that one pearl that is most important. It is the seeking and the eventual finding. What if you had a dream? You long for that dream. You desire to see that dream realized. And when it is there standing in front of you, what are you going to do? When you know that that dream will make the difference in all of your life. This pearl merchant, when he found the pearl of great price, he sold everything that he had, sold everything, disposed of everything, and for the love of that pearl of great price entered into an agreement to accept that pearl of great price into his life. Well, you know who the pearl of great price is? Jesus. If you consider Jesus as the real thing and at some point in your life learns of his imminent return would you not put every effort you can to make sure that when he comes, you will certainly find yourself making ready, being ready, and truly ready for his appearing? Jesus, the pearl of great price, the most valuable of them all. You found Jesus. Hold on to him. I wouldn't exchange Jesus, not for anything, in this world. There is no other name given 
under heaven by which we must be saved. Only the name of Jesus. And after all of your search, you find Jesus. What will you do? Accept Him. Take Him into your heart. Take Him into your life because He makes the difference. Somebody sent me a text message last Sabbath. And I like that text message. I love that because that text message tells me that I am a millionaire, although I'm not. I am a millionaire in Jesus. I am a millionaire in Jesus because in Jesus, I have the entire wealth of the universe with me in Jesus. In Jesus, I have the Father. In Jesus, I don't need anything. In Jesus, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. In Jesus, I have a mansion in heaven. In Jesus, I have all the time of my life, eternity. I'm a millionaire in Jesus, more than a millionaire. But the problem is this, my problem and maybe your problem. Jesus is not with us. We can only think of Him. We can only contemplate on Him, His goodness, His riches, His grace, His salvation. What I want to see is Jesus come in my lifetime. Because when He comes in my lifetime and I am with Him, then truly I become the richest person in the entire universe. But I want Jesus to come not because I want to be rich. No! I want Jesus to come beyond all riches. I want Jesus be to come because He is the key to an eternal, meaningful life. Without Jesus, everything is drab. Everything is boring. Everything is simply pretension. Now, this parable of the ten virgins is drawing our attention to something that we must do, something that we must urgently do, and that is to prepare ourselves for the coming of Jesus. So what if you found Jesus? So what if you found the pearl of great price? Paul was saying, if in this life only we have hope in Jesus, let me paraphrase that. Paul was saying, if here on earth only we have Jesus, if Jesus is here with us only in this earth, if there is no heaven beyond, we are of all creatures the most to be pitied. pitied. No, Jesus is my Jesus beyond this sordid, mundane, earthly, sinful planet. I have my Jesus for eternity. And when He comes, and He's going to come very soon, when He comes, it will be a great, great joy for me to be with Him. Oh, I love to think of Jesus along that line. I'd like, I'd like to think of Jesus as my Savior who has saved me from my sins, not only in this earth, on this earth, but He saved me so that I can enter into the glories of the kingdom. The kingdom beckons. He's calling me. He's calling you. Jesus died for you. And I'm saying this not simply because I'm speaking as a preacher. I'm, sp I'm saying this not simply because I have to do this as a preacher. No. There is a certain there is something in the death of Jesus 
that I may not be able to explain to you in full tonight. But I believe that if I really hold on to the Jesus who died for me, I will see him one of these days. I want you to look at Jesus. Consider Jesus. He died for you, not, that, not just for you to live on this earth, but for you to join him for eternity. I'd like to call my group again because I want to close on this note. I want us to understand how Jesus loves us so much. I want us to understand that Jesus truly died for us. Jesus calls us. The kingdom of God is so close to us. We don't realize how close the kingdom of glory is. We are standing on the threshold of eternity. And God is calling you. Jesus died for you so that we can enter into the glories of that kingdom. Tonight, as I close, I'd like to invite all of you to pray with me. Loving Heavenly Father, I am praying that you will be with this institution. It's a great institution, Father. Great professors, great leaders, great students, I pray, Father, that you will pour out your mighty spirit upon everyone who is inside this campus, that they may not just learn about Jesus mentally, that they may not just learn of Jesus theologically, but that they may learn of Jesus in a very personal way so that the lives of every one of your children in this campus 
may reflect the beauty of what Jesus did at the cross. Oh, Father, lead us. Bless this people, your children. I pray that you will help them to shine as lights like a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Let your children in this place shine forth around that the people around them may also see Jesus because the people around them also have a right to enter into the glories of that kingdom. But we know that they will never have a chance to enter that glorious kingdom if they will not be given the chance to know who Jesus is. And I pray, Father, that in a very, very mighty way, you will lead every soul in this campus to truly shine for you, that in their lives they may show forth the righteousness of Jesus, the spotless character of our Savior who died on the cross for us. Let this be our prayer and let this be, let this be also our life while we wait for the sun coming of Jesus that we may reflect his character in our lives. Accept us tonight, O Father, and be with us. Truly the kingdom beckons. Help us, Father, to listen to the voice of that kingdom talking to us tonight in Jesus, our Savior. In his name, in his most wonderful name, I pray. Amen.